Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alain Oliver. I'm the executive director of the Love and Fidelity Network. And I'm also your moderator for this session. Today, we will be joined by Sharif and Gabby Gurgis. We will have this in two parts. Sharif will speak first, then Gabby will speak, and then both of them at the same time will join us. So it'll be a fun way to have an interaction with them. Allow me to introduce Sharif. Sharif is an appellate litigator with Jones Day in Washington, DC. Before entering private practice, Sharif served as a law clerk for Justice Samuel Alito on the, of the Supreme Court and Judge Griffith of the US Court of Appeals in the DC Circuit. Sharif earned his JD at Yale Law School where he served as editor of the Yale Law, Law Journal. He has a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He has a PhD in philosophy from Princeton University. And his bachelor's degree is in philosophy from Princeton University as well, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude in 2008. He is a co-author of What is Marriage, Man and Woman, A Defense, and Debating Religious Liberty and Discrimination, released by Oxford University Press in 2017. Sharif has spoken on over 100 conferences and debates on moral and legal reasoning and in many public uh, popular venues. Please welcome to the Love and Fidelity Network's National Conference, Sharif. Oh. Thank you so much, Alain, and thank you to you and to Brittany and to everybody who's been involved in getting this together. We're super grateful to be invited and to be a part of it. I myself am a bit anxious about this talk. I've given plenty of talks, but almost all of them are abstract. That's where I'm comfortable. I'm not good at giving practical <laughs> advice. So we've done two things about that. One is that I'm going to talk for very little of our joint time, and Gabby will talk for a lot more of it, which you will be grateful for at the end of this. And then the other accommodation of my handicap we've done is that I am going to be starting out fairly general and abstract and theoretical, inching towards the practical, and then five or six minutes in, I'll stop, and Gabby will give you a lot more helpful detail on the general framework that we're both thinking of this issue in terms of. And the issue we have, the topic we understand ourselves to be addressing is how to have a healthy and flourishing married life. The first thought I had about this is that it's very often the case that people get too prescriptive about it, that they think that the particular practices that worked for them at a particular time will work for them all the time and will work for other couples. So in an attempt to overcorrect for that, I've tried to think about a general recipe for generating practices and best tips for any given couple. And the way we think of it is, I mean, one way to think of uh, our approach is to distinguish between the ideals and the practices. So the ideals are the ends, they're the goal. Uh, and they're absolutely fixed, immovable, uncompromisable. And then the practices are much more flexible. They're just means to the ideal, to the goal. And they're the kinds of things that need to change over time. You need to have detachment from them and be willing to discard them or pick up new ones as the ideals require. So, and this is something that can be true in all areas of life you know, the ideals of being a student versus the best practices and so on. But when it comes to marriage, what is the ideal? Well, the ideal, and this is my one bit of theory for the five minutes, is the marriage itself. Marriage is its own ideal. It's valuable in itself, not just as a means to other things. And thinking about that can actually have some concrete practical implications. So first we gotta figure out what the ideal itself is. So it's marriage for its own sake, but what is marriage? Well, as Alain mentioned, I have a book about that, uh, but very briefly for these purposes, we're thinking about it in terms of a union of heart, mind, and body that's oriented to family life, to bearing and rearing new kids and engaging in the kind of all around sharing of domestic life that goes with that naturally. If you want the defense of that, see the book and plenty of other works by other people. Um, but here I'm just thinking, well, what flows from that. So thinking of that as the ideal and everything else 
as a practice that better serves that. So, so it's basically the ideal here is a form of loving union and service. The form has the specifics that I just mentioned, but it's a form of loving union and service. That's the goal. That's the thing that's uncompromising. The other thing that's uncompromising about it is because of the nature of this particular form of loving service, it, everything else has to be consistent with it. In other words, anytime you have to make triage and figure out what's going to be compromised for what, the marriage takes priority. It takes priority over every other relationship and ideal except God, if you're religious and understand God to have ultimate priority as Gabby and I do. What does that mean in practice? Well, um, to give you a sense of one way to avoid the pitfalls of confusing practice for the ideal, take complementarity. If you're part of an LFN-affiliated group, you've probably thought a lot about sexual complementarity and what that means and requires. And I think one way to think about it is that it's a set of practices. It's a set of means. And they're means to a particular ideal, which is serving the ideal of marriage better. You're developing a set of practices and virtues and skills because you think these are the ones that will put you in the best position to serve the ideal of loving union and service to a member of the opposite sex. But then once you're actually married, you have the ultimate goal and purpose of complementarity sitting in front of you across from you at the kitchen table. Like this is the person that you have been training yourself as a man or as a woman to serve. And once that's true, it takes on a different shape. You can be a little more flexible. If, if your preconceived notion of masculinity had it that men do the finances, but you happen to be a guy married to an accountant, well, maybe that's not the most natural way to best love and serve the other. And the best division of labor that serves the ideal, the ultimate goal here, the relationship itself, is one where she has the finances and you have something else. So the general idea here is that something that we tend to think of as an ideal in itself I think is best thought of, and the marriage will be healthiest if it's thought of as a means to an end of the ideal of the loving union itself. Career is another thing that it's helpful to think of in these terms. When I, before I was married or had kids, I was thinking of career as its own ideal in a lot of ways. And so I had a very specific set of ambitions and was working very hard for them. Getting married and having kids required me to demote that to a practice, a means. Um, that needs to be at least consistent with and ideally serving the ideal, and in this case, marriage and family. Concretely, one thing that means, and I think to make it applicable to most men in particular will be tempted, I think, or a lot of men are tempted, to think of career in very competitive terms. I need to be the best accountant, the best professor, the best law clerk, whatever it is, on the scene. And if you are thinking in those terms, then automatically you're violating one of the things we said is true about this ideal of marriage, which is that it takes priority. Because if your benchmark is how other people are doing at your workplace, rather than what's consistent with this marriage, there's no guarantee those two things will cohere. So thinking of marriage as a certain kind of loving service and as having a natural priority over everything else shapes the practices and the means that you adopt. Another thing about ideals is that unlike practices, which are concrete and you can start and finish them, ideals are inexhaustible. And so one thing that we have tried to do is at regular intervals, sit down and figure out, have we served the ideal well? Are we farther along in the ideal in this totally inexhaustible adventure than we were the last time we checked in? And if not, what practices need to change? Um, another thing to remember is that the ideal has the specific shape that it does and not another. So it's about marriage and family life. And some any given marriage and family can be shaped towards further specific goals. For example, as two grad students, we often thought of ourselves as like having a kind of ministry as professors at the same place where we would be mentors to students together. That's a really valuable, beautiful way to specify this particular ideal for ourselves. But we have to be flexible even about that specification because it's not an essential part of marriage. And I've seen more than one marriage falter because the couple got attached to a particular specification of the ideal instead of remembering that that specification is really itself just another means. And it needs to be flexible because the thing that matters in itself and that's of ultimate priority is the relationship itself, a form of loving service, which can take different shapes at different times. And then there are a set of, I think, general always norms, as it were, for, for marriages um, that I think no matter what the specifics are, will, will be a useful practice. And so I'll just go through a lightning round of these and then 
we'll switch mercifully to Gabby. So one is we found that the five love languages, as corny as it is, that book, which talks about the different ways that people, the five buckets in which people fall in terms of the preferences they have for how someone shows love to them is actually unfortunately really useful and of great practical value. So I recommend that. I recommend The Temperament God Gave You as another book that tells you about the strengths and weaknesses that people tend to have. Um, being very specific and quick about apologies. So not a general, I'm sorry I was crappy yesterday, but like, I'm sorry for doing X, Y, Z. And equally specific and frequent about thank yous. So not just thanks for being great, but thanks for doing X, Y, Z for me yesterday. Uh, specific and frequent about public compliments for the spouse. Um, absolutely against any public criticism of the spouse, against any complaints, even inner grumbling and complaint about the spouse. You do have to talk to other people sometimes to go through to figure out you know, how to overcome problems, but we both think that having one or two people that you confide in and that you trust who shares your vision of marriage and family is absolutely essential and immovable and uncompromisable um, rather than having a more general kind of attitude of complaint towards other people. Uh, and then um, treating contempt. I mean, if any form of loving union, this will be true. If the ideal is love and union and growth and love and growth and service to the other, any hint of contempt, which means either thinking less of the person having a kind of lower estimation of them in some way, or finding yourself wanting to hurt in some way. And this is, if you're a normal couple, it's not going to take big forms. So it'll be a very subtle thing, but little, little jabs, little insults, those are directly against the form of loving union and service that the ideal is. So there will be some practices that will be true for anybody because of the nature of the ideal. But everything else, I think it's helpful to think of it as a means that can help you grow or not grow with respect to this inexhaustible thing, which is a particular form of love and service to the other, which has to take priority over every other ideal, every natural ideal you've got. That's me. I think we're supposed to take a break now, and then mercifully you'll hear from Gabby. and laying down the conceptual uh, framework from which we can explore this. We'd like to thank our uh, weekend sponsor of the National Conference, the Wheatley Institution. The Wheatley Institution at Brigham Young University believes the, the civility, dignity, and equity put at risk in our current social crisis can be restored by rebuilding authentic confidence in core institutions of civil society, beginning with the family. The Wheatley Institution supports and defends the formation of families, congregations, and communities through practical, research-based thought leadership and training. If you are interested in learning more, please visit wheatley.byu.edu. Wheatley.byu.edu. Now we are going to speak with Gabby Gerges. Allow me to introduce her first. Gabby is the wife, is a wife, mother, and recent and recently completed her PhD in politics at Princeton University, concentrating in political theory. Prior to Princeton University, she graduated with a BA in the public in the program of liberal studies at Notre Dame and worked as a managing editor of public discourse. Her dissertation, directed by Professor Robert P. George, defends the special protection of religion in American law. Her other academic interests include the history of political thought, the inter intersection of religion and politics in contemporary democracies, and natural law ethical theory. More importantly, she finds great joy in her marriage to her incredible and saintly husband and in caring for their two girls, Mary and Lucy, ages three and one. Please welcome everyone. Please welcome Gabby. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank Brittany and Elaine and the other conference organizers for inviting Sharif and me. It's really an honor and a joy to be here. Um, especially since Sharif and I have only been married for a handful of years, I'm sure there are many 
better qualified men and women who could talk to you about these practical experiences. Um, and we're really, we really appreciate the opportunity. I thought I would begin right with the title of the panel, which is Casting a Healthy Vision of Marriage. I want to use Sharif's in my experience trying to juggle a couple of academic careers and family life to talk a little bit about what a healthy vision of marriage could look like for each of you in a very practical way. Having that vision means, I think, having an ongoing plan for your life um, about who you want to become as a married couple. And that plan is going to involve growth for you as an individual person and growth for you as a unit with your spouse. To fill out those plans following Sharif's general direction of giving general guidance rather than prescriptions that would apply uniformly across the table, I'm going to propose a list of five basic questions that I think you could ask as you go forward in your lives and revisit over the next couple of decades, each of which is geared toward fashioning a healthy vision of what your marriage should be about and how you're going to grow in it. I'm going to share some of those answers to the question that I've given in my own life. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about ways in which I think I've fallen short or tried to live up to those goals that I've set for myself or that Sharif and I have set for us together. And these questions are, in summary, about care for your own health, physical and spiritual, service to your spouse and to your family, service to others, accountability, and cultivating true leisure with your spouse. The first question about, I'm just gonna read these as a series of questions that you could reflect on. The first set of questions, how am I carving out time to care for my body as well as my soul with all of the pains and fatigues of family life built in? What do my spouse and I do together to grow in our faith if we profess a particular religion? On care for the body, I think it's worth sharing just anecdotally that it took me actually a very long time to settle into a good routine of nutrition and exercise. And prior to pregnancy and children, I didn't eat well, I didn't exercise regularly. Um, I thought I could just eat whatever I wanted without thinking about the long-term impact. But after having children and trying to feed them well, that's helped me change the way that I eat too. And it's also inspired me to try to build my physical strength through core strengthening exercises and so on. And that has amazing ripple effects in all areas of my life. I just feel more energized. I feel much more capable of being the person that I think I'm called to be. I think it's also important to have just something, to have clear, distinct things that you like to do for fun and that are really truly leisurely, not in the sense of you know, mind-numbing watching of Netflix and eating binge eating food that you like, although I've certainly done both of those plenty of times. Um, but having something that you like to do for fun, that's a healthy challenge that you, you engage in and then you feel really restored afterward. Um, in terms of caring for your spiritual life in marriage, if you are a religious person, I think in one sense, spiritual life becomes a lot harder when you're married because it's harder to focus when you're, you know, in church with your family and the kids are holding on to you and pulling you to the back. And it's hard to find time to go by yourself to, to pray. Um, but it matters just as much. And it's really, um, it also, like care for the body, has these really great ripple effects in, in the rest of your life. Um, and it's also easier in another sense because it becomes much more apparent how everything that you do can take on this supernatural significance. It can become part of an ongoing conversation with God about the needs of your loved ones and the things that you do can become ways, things that you can offer to God for them. Um, that is, I'm saying that from a kind of particular Catholic tradition of thought about the spiritual life, but it's certainly been very helpful for Sharif and me both. Um, and it's also just as important, I think, to try to cultivate as much as possible a daily prayer routine with your spouse. Shreep and I have worked away at this for years and we're still not very good at it, um, but we do now have a kind of set of short nightly prayers that we try to say together. And that has, we've seen tangible concrete effects from that um, every day, really. So, all right, second set of questions about service to my family, service to your own family. Which responsibilities to your spouse and to your children do you feel a particular need to focus on right now? Are there specific needs that they have that you think you have a job to try to help them meet that they're not getting to meet? To give a couple of practical examples from our life, Sharif has had a really busy um, last couple of years. He clerked for Justice Alito at the Supreme Court, which is a notoriously 
grueling job. He now works full time as a law firm associate, and he's also preparing academic job applications so that we can hopefully move on to the next chapter of life and, and settle at a university or a college somewhere. Um, but that means that because there are all those demands on his time and from lots of different people outside of our family, he also is human and has very basic needs like sleep, eating well, exercising, getting to mass, being friends, that he doesn't always have time or even energy to get to himself. And so I really have become aware of the need for me as his wife to make sure that he can do those things. And I haven't really done a good enough job of that, um, but it's something that I've become more certainly more aware of. Um, third set of questions about service to people outside the family. So the general question you would be asking is, what can I do to serve others outside the home, whether that's in part-time or full-time work, volunteering, and how, even more importantly, do I integrate that with my prior responsibilities inside the home? How can my spouse and I cultivate generosity to others outside of our family as a couple? Just a few brief anecdotes, again, from my own experience that you might find useful. Um, one is that I personally have struggled with seeing my academic work as kind of all about me and my own advancement. And it's been really hard to remember that it's always a form of service to others, even when you're doing very self-absorbed academic work, like studying in the library and writing drafts of things. Um, and I've also had to learn, though in some ways I think it came more naturally than I was expecting, to see my marriage and motherhood as prior to my academic work. Um, so that could be in something as simple as my child asked me, my older daughter Mary asked me to read to her and I'm in the middle of trying to meet a deadline that I didn't meet already because I didn't use my time well the night before to, to finish it. Um, and you know, saying no to her in the moment is kind of a failure of me uh, on my part to, to really prioritize the, the, the marriage and motherhood vocation. Um, I also thought I would just say a couple of things about the actual integration of service to others outside the home with service in the home. Uh, I've had also a very kind of crazy last couple of years. I had a very complicated second pregnancy that required multiple surgeries while my daughter was still in utero. Um, and I also was trying to finish my dissertation all with the backdrop of Sharif being in a really intense part of his own career. Um, and so that really forced me to learn how to just be efficient with time and also, frankly, to develop prayer habits to sustain me through that through that difficult period. So um, just for example, I learned to write basically through advice, great advice from other moms who were older, slightly older than me and more experienced and had more children to write exclusively during nap time and to begin that short amount of time, however short it is with a, sh with a brief prayer and just inviting God to come into my work and to make it a moment of grace rather than a moment of drudgery. Um, and those habits, those small habits, have become the backbone of my work now, even though I'm finished with my PhD. That's generally still how I try to approach doing any kind of work. Um, and it's part, I think, as, as part of this third general category of, of questions about your service, how do you balance your service outside the home with service within, um, is you, you have to sometimes ask, you're going to be forced to ask, is my work outside the home causing too much stress and burden in my family? And if so, how do, I, how do I adjust to fix that? This is kind of a way of addressing what Sharif said about, you know, the marriage itself is always the ideal and the other things are just the practices or the means to, to realizing it. Um, Sharif and I have at various points each felt that the other's career development was putting, taking too much of a hit on the rest of us. It, when I was trying to finish my dissertation, when he was clerking for Justice Alito, that was there were some really tough periods and we learned i think a very practical approach in response to that that i think many other couples who are juggling a couple of academic careers with children um, would tell you and that is that we just basically focus intensely on on one person's development at a time we are never um kind of both trying to steamroll ahead to the finish line so practically for me, that looked like uh, taking a few months off of finishing my dissertation, st basically stalling it so that Sharif could speed write a job talk for his um, job applications. And then on his part, like when I had to finish, he totally pitched in and did lots of baths and 
bedtime and he still does dishes every day. He made doctor's appointments. He even took time off of work so that I could, um, so that he could edit things for me. And he spent countless nights just looking through drafts over and over for me. So um, basically we've, we've learned that we just have to take this very much teamwork approach. And it's beautiful because you get to see this self-sacrifice among the individual members of the family for the good of one member that serves the the family as a whole. And it's just this kind of amazing gift of marriage. All right, fourth question is, who are my accountability buddies? This is like, I think one of the most important questions you're gonna have to ask yourself, especially if you're a woman and you're trying to juggle what feel like too many balls in the, in the court. Um, so I regularly, over the last couple of years, have started having just informal chats with, um, like I said, older, slightly older moms who have a lot more children and who have accomplished much more than I have just about how things are going for me. How's my writing? How's my prayer life? How are my children? How am I trying to balance everything, um, pull it together? Um, and then just as importantly, I, um, I could not have finished the dissertation, which I did over the summer without having a weekly writing group. Over the last couple of years, um, I, I've been in a weekly writing group with three dear friends of mine who are juggling a very similar balance of family and academic work. And every week, just to have this kind of low pressure, but still firm expectation of that I would submit something, even if it was just a paragraph, was enough to kind of help me plow through the last chapter and then publish the chapter as an article and then finish the dissertation. So that was super, super important. Fifth and finally, this question is about um, what things do I, what things do my spouse and I enjoy in common that we can keep pursuing together? And this is an important question to ask yourself because it will continue to give rise to new opportunities to always be serving others, both within your family and outside. Um, and and in, in order to even have those pursuits to begin with, you really have to have this absolutely solid communication with your spouse. Um, I think it might surprise you to know that we, um, that, um, sorry, battery running low on the computer. Um, it might surprise you to know that Shreve and I actually struggle even to get sometimes just 10 to 15 minutes together of solid conversation. It's not about work without our children present, um, but when we do, it's really rewarding. And we've also actually started a tradition um, recently of just doing a Saturday date night. And we went through a rough period of a couple of years where we really didn't go on any dates regularly. Um, and that was, that's, it's just been really wonderful to put our kids to bed after mac and cheese on Saturday night and then have a nice dinner with, with wine and, and just talk. Um, and in terms of actual like common pursuits that you enjoy through, um, it's sort of embarrassing to say this, but Shreve and I are very unathletic and we're very dirty. So um, our our main form of entertainment together is just we talk. We talk about everything, about our ideas, about our work, about our friends, about our family, about our kids. Um, and that's been really good though, because it's given rise to a lot of hosting of friends and family. That's one way we see ourselves being generous together. Um, but we have also talked about co-authoring things together in the future. We haven't actually done it yet, but I think we will probably in the not too distant future. And our most recent work, um, this is just a final kind of nice anecdote I wanted to share with you. Our most recent work, I think is one of the best gifts of our marriage because it, and it shows the importance of like working together in marriage as a team because we're writing on exactly the same topic, which is the specialness of religion and it's important distinct protection in American law. And each of the things that we're doing, a job talk paper for him, a dissertation for me, um, is reflecting the insights that we've had just from like dinner table conversations over the screaming children uh, about the work. And um, that's been, it's been really wonderful to see. So thank you so much again for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. And we look forward to a little bit of Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gabby. <laughs> we really appreciate that. We're going to give you a couple seconds here to get ready so that you and Sharif can right. field some questions. But it's really clear that you're both incredibly deliberate about what you're attempting to accomplish. And I think that's essential for anything that we hold uh, with dearly in, or in value, right? If we want to be healthy, we have to be very deliberate about that. And there's so many ways to get healthy. Right. You could do you could be uh, more of an anaerobic person or aerobic person. Uh, you could take this diet or that diet as a form of how you choose to eat and uh, what you you know, how you want to fuel your body. So it's really it's I hear it loud and clear that you're hyper deliberate 
you're very focused on the long-term goal, and that you're constantly balancing and rebalancing the relationship because nothing stands still. Every stage, um, every every year is a new stage, and as your children grow, those stages will also uh, come forth and be quite clear and deliberate in, in your life. So if um, you're ready now, we can go ahead and uh, move into some uh, a number set of questions that we have. Sure. All right, wonderful. So this is the first question, if I may. Um, pretty classic question that we get a lot um, from students is, do you recommend that spouses stagger their education? For example, having only one spouse enrolled at a time, or maybe only one working on their dissertation at a time. What are your thoughts? How have you guys managed that? What would you recommend? Yeah, so I'll take that. First, I want to clarify that I am not wearing shoes and Gabby is, and that's the only reason that she's taller than me in this image. It's not the natural state of affairs. Perfect. That's Real fine. It's, well, I didn't mind it. I just want to I don't to think clarify. it makes that much of a difference. That's, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe you should put them back on there. Um, the, uh, yes, I think staggering of some kind is really helpful. It's sometimes hard to plan it that way. I happen to have started earlier, um, but finished later, not actually finished yet because of the in-between stuff. But what I will say is even if you, if you meet after you've started, for example, there are still ways to do this. At a macro scale, once you're past the first two years, there's a little bit more flexibility about how quickly to do teaching versus writing towards your dissertation. Um, and using that flexibility to do what Gabby was mentioning earlier, which is basically toggle back and forth between, all right, right now, it's like the next six weeks are full-time Gabby work. And then I and my mother-in-law or my mom or my siblings, whatever, are doing everything we can to make that happen. And then, you know, there may be several months where then I'm the one who's doing more of the work on dissertation. So to the, you, even if you don't stagger the whole program, you can stagger within the program to make that kind of thing uh, feasible. That sounds great. It sounds like a lot of just-in-time management. Uh, thank you so much. Our second question here is from Brandon. How do you deal with childcare as as grad students? So when you're in graduate school, how do you guys deal with childcare? Um, that's assuming that your children were born while you were uh, working on your PhDs. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, and again, it's one where I don't think there are necessarily uniform prescription that would work across the board for everyone. But I know in our case, we try it as much as possible to always involve family in the care of our children. Um, so we really tried to use the opportunities when we needed to work to have like our, uh, for a year in Princeton, we actually had my lovely sister living with us as a part, like as a part-time nanny. Um, we had my mom stay with us for an extended period. I've had my mother-in-law stay with us for an extended period. And that's been really great for our kids because they're not just, they're getting quality time with their grandparents. So it doesn't feel like as much of a hit on um, family life when you know you have someone else that you don't really know very well watching your children. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh Thank you so much. I wish we had time to actually ask about 100,000 questions because there's so many particulars that need to be approached. Um, but we're deeply appreciative of your time. We wish you continued success in, in your uh, career and most importantly in your family life and raising your two beautiful children and, if they're, if, uh, and maybe if the family grows as well. Uh, no pressure there. So thank you so much, Sharif, Sharif and Gabby, for sharing your experience and for answering our questions. Thank you and have, Absolutely. Uh, have a good afternoon. You too, you thanks. Too. Thank you. It was my pleasure to be your MC today, but most importantly, I'd like to thank all our sponsors who made this event possible and for all the donors who have contributed to the Love and Fidelity Network over the years. If you found our national conference, these presentations meaningful, please consider becoming a sponsor, a contributing member to the Love and Fidelity Network. Your monthly gift helps us preserve our unique voice on college campuses and across all of the United States. For more information on the opportunity to give, please visit loveandfidelity.org forward slash friend, loveandfidelity.org forward slash friend. 
If you're interested in learning more about what we do on campus and participating in one of our upcoming reading groups, in joining our national message campaign, or subscribing to our newsletter where we provide insights and thoughts and commentary on uh, culture and on campus culture, you can do so on our website. Once again, loveandfidelity.org. I appreciate you taking the time to spend with us and we wish everyone the best of luck in all your endeavors. Stay focused on your goals, constantly keep rebalancing and you will achieve a flourishing life. That is our hope for everyone um, that's hearing this and even for those who are not hearing this. Um, actually, it's our goal for everybody. May we all flourish deeply and uh, deliberately so. Thank you.